responsibility and the key elements in how she structures who is responsible to reform an unjust system. So I will read directly a, a paragraph from her text on page 104. She says, different agents have different kinds and degrees of forward-looking responsibility for justice. Such difference derive in large measure from the social position agents occupy in relation to one another within the structural process they are trying to change in order to make them less unjust. So two critical elements here is, first of all, there are multiple agents within the system that can be held accountable, or at least that can be held responsible, not accountable. Those, those are somehow different concepts. Um, so who will be responsible depends on who you are in that system. And the second point is, if we say there are multiple actors within, within that system that is responsible for injustice and therefore to, 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 to bring somehow to bring this reform, then how do we distinguish this, between these this different actors? Then she says, we look at their positionality within the, the, the social structure, within the structure, where are they positioned? Then the next question is then, how do we define this positionality? That's a question and she brings four parameters of positionality. The first one is power. Power refers to institutions. Uh, such as private corporations and companies that do have a financial, um, but also the leverage and control to influence global as well as national level institutions. Because of their financial leverage, because of the scope economy and the scale that they have across the globe and within countries, then she argues institutions such as, or entities such as corporations do have the primary responsibility at least important responsibility to reform an unjust system if they believe that the unjust system needs to be reformed. Here, what we need to ask ourselves is as an Oromo, as a society, as a, also not only also Oromo, but the broader south of Ethiopia, um, to what extent are we making use of economic actors that belong to the society? Are they working to reform, to disrupt the unjust system, or are they silent complicit with the unjust system and hence beneficiaries of that system? If they are beneficiaries, then it's a time to somehow ring a bell and bring them on board so that they start questioning that system. Then the second parameter um, Young identifies is the privilege parameter. These are actors, both individual institutions or groups that are not actively involved, for example, in the past historical injustice, but they are beneficiaries of the system because of the group they belong to and where they stand today. So they might claim that, well, this is not a wrong that I have done. So there is no causal link and relationship between what is happening against the group A and me. But they are not perpetrators, but they are beneficiaries. Past, past injustice put groups on unequal relationship and on unequal footing. Therefore, this privileged position makes them responsible to act to disrupt the unjust system and structure, then interest targets victims. Now we often assume victims are actually supposed to be protected and we don't hold them to account. In fact, one of the criticism that is raised against um, Young's account of responsibility is that this can turn out as a blame game, um, uh, as, as, sorry, not blame game, but as, um, holding the victim to account is adding a burden, additional burden on the victim. But that is not the case because if we want to assert the victim's agency in the process of transforming an unjust system, then as recipients of the injustice, as a primary recipients of the injustice, then they have the primary responsibility again to speak out, to ask for help, to stand in solidarity to question that system. And when they do so, individuals, 
by themselves might not have the resource and the capacity to mobilize, which is why then we come to the collective ability dimension of young, which says that to enable victims, we need those actors, such as associations, professional groups, religious groups, to get on board and enable the victims to act in solidarity and collectively because those types of associations do have a better leverage and resource to influence the system. And now within this context, we have um, the, this four parameters of responsibility within which we, we all have some place to fit in. So in a way, the kind of responsibility when we think of human rights violation as a systemic challenge is a responsibility that we have to, 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 to take ourselves. For example, where am I positioned? Am I in the interest parameter? Am I the victim of the system? Or am I in the privilege? Either way, I have to take a step. And that step is a positive step. That positive step is a step to reform the unjust system. And that step is not about demanding a remedy for an individual, rather that step is about trying to reform the system, to disrupt the unjust system. And how do we do that? Um, that we have, in fact, existing not only positive, but also moral claims, such as the right to self-determination, often People take the right to self-determination by its, the, from the partial value of the as a political claim, but the right to self-determination is beyond that. The right to self-determination is the right to have an access to the decision-making process, the right to come together to assert one's own interests within that system. And by using this, people can act in solidarity to overcome um, the process. And this is how um, I would like to kind of um, uh, briefly somehow re-evaluate. Yeah, this is not a new notion, of course, a, a lot of literatures, both by leading Oromo scholars, but also by non-Oromo scholars have been done. But maybe it's just a, a reminder that when we speak of human rights violation in the country, putting it in the systemic context might help a little bit in looking at and understanding our situation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure we'll have some questions for you later. So I'll move on now to welcome our next speaker. Um, I, yeah, he needs to be co-host. So Gemechu Abishu, Abishu, Abishu is our next speaker. So Dr. Gemechu is a racialized refugee researcher currently working as a postdoctoral fellow at York University. He earned his PhD in social anthropology from Bayreuth University in Germany and his MA in Governance Studies from Antwerp University in Belgium. His research interests include forced displacements, racialized refugees integration, and emerging non-state forms of political power. He is a research affiliate at the Center for Refugee Studies at York University and the CHEPO, CHEPO, forgive me, sorry, Institute for African Studies at WLU. He is researching the experiences of racialized refugees in Canada. And he is also a co-chair of the Racism and Refugee Subcommittee at the Center for Refugee Studies at York University. Um, so with that, I will give the floor over to Dr. Gamechu. Um, hi, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where um, you are tuning from. Um, can you see my screen? Let me ask that first. Screen. Can you hear us? We see your screen, but you're just not in full screen mode, but we can see you. So if you start okay. your presentation, then it will become full screen. Okay. Um, let me... Oh, now, we've, now we don't see your screen at all. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. And so just as soon as you start your, your presentation, you should be... Uh, now you're in presenter mode, so we are seeing your notes. 
um, I'll just go like this, uh, if it is okay. Um, so first, um, let me say thank you very much for the invite to speak um, at OSAS Media Conference. Um, my presentation is structured to five parts. Um, in the first part, I'll briefly speak to um, introduct, I provide introductory remarks, um, which will be followed by um, a, a brief uh, overview of the history of Amara settlement in the Western Oromia, in particular emphasis in my case, the area. Um, thirdly, I will speak to the violence against the Oro, uh, which has been going on since um, the turn of end of 19th century. Um, and um, the fourth part of my speech um, will focus on the aim of the Pannon Amara vigilantes um, in relation to the um, violence and atrocities we um, currently going on um, in Eastern Wallega part of Oromia. And finally, I will give um, a concluding remark, but drawing attention to um, policy implications. Um, I will start my presentation with um, the core argument of my presentation, which is Fano and Amara vigilantes um, commit violent atrocities and displace tens of thousands of Romo for, for one stated political aim, which is annexation of this part of Romia. And uh, what um, I, I, I and the other speakers call um, the creation of the Greater Amara, and which is an extension of the Ethiopian imperial project. And I will also argue that violence is used as an, an instrument, um, and which speaks to Cloud's argument that um, violence is politics as or other means. And I will make my argument by drawing data from one specific district um, called Gidayana or Gidayana, um, which is located in West East, Eastern um, East Wallega zone of Oromia National Regional State. Um, as uh, most of you are aware, in, in recent years. Um, this district has witnessed an increase in both intensity and a scope of attacks um, on civilian population. Um, and as we speak today, um, out of the 32 Kabbalists um, in the district, um, about 12 of them or more have been expelled from about 12 of them. And there are about nearly uh, 50,000 um, internally displaced people in and around um, the district capital. Um, in terms of uh, methodology, um, this article draws data from secondary sources, available secondary sources, but also from the um, Uppsala Conflict Data Program, which is a data set um, with all its limitations when it comes to disaggregation, I think. Um, the fact that they have in three about uh, um, incidents of conflict um, in Western Oromia in general and um, in Gita in particular is uh, something to be recommend recommended. Now, I will um, go to the history of Amara settlement in Wallega. Um, to understand the protracted attack on the Oromo, I think it is important to look into the history of Amara settlement um, in Western Oromia. Um, so I will start with a question, uh, when did the Amara settl settl settlers come to these areas? And you will see from my presentation um, this afternoon um, that the Amara settled in Western Oromia in general and in Jitta. Ayana district in particular in three waves. The first wave of settlers came during the imperial period, um, which is from about 1880s, uh, which lasted up to 1974. Um, and initially, Minilik brought Amara settlers who were introduced to the area in the 19th century to pacify the, uh, the area. And uh, this is a part of the um, colonial conquest project, um, a process which has been um, described differently by different scholars, including as a process of internal colonialism, for example, by Addis um, Donham James, and also as a Abyssinianization process. Amara um, were also settled during Emperor Ali Selassie as part of his settlement policy in the 1970s. And in particular, and worth noting is his third year five development prog program, which ran from 1968 to 1973, which stipulated the regime's intention of settling Northern Ethiopians in the greater south, um, but mainly in Oromia. And according to the first, uh, accordingly, the first settlers uh, came to Jidayana as part of this policy in 1971, and in a specific place called Gutten, which is currently one of the focal points of um, the ongoing conflict. Settlers during the second wave of settlers came during the mid 1980s. 
Um, you see in response to the mid-1980s famine, uh, which devastated northern part of Ethiopia, the Derg regime embarked on a plan to resettle nearly half a million people from Wallo and the Tigray provinces in those days to Oromia and the greater south. And as Alula um, argued, resettlement was seen as one way of putting areas that were labeled as no man's land to use. And you see, Oromo land has been perceived as a no man's land. The third wave of settlers, and which I should underline is a focal point of the ongoing conflict, and which largely is an illegal settlement, um, came after the 1996-97, a period when a massive land redistribution took place in the Amara region. Bear in mind, these settlers came mainly from Gojam zones. And what is interesting, as I've already mentioned, is this wave of settlement, which is in post-1991 regime, in the post-1991 regime, came against the backdrop of intentional or unintentional discouragement of inter-regional uh, resettlement. And of course, um, this massive settlement from the Amara region to Oromia was illegal. According to one his study, up to 80,000 illegal settlers have migrated from the Gujam zone to settle in several districts in the then East Wallaga zone, but currently East Wallaga and Oruguru Wallagas, in particular in Jiddayana district, in Kiramu, in Limu, and Oruguru district. Although they were illegal, the Opidio government bent backward to accommodate the settlers back then. And according to data obtained from the um, Jiddayana district, for instance, out of the 54 primary schools available in the district currently, Five of them are Amharic only schools. And five uh, additional schools are Amharic and Oromo school. And these are meant to accommodate the interests and demands of illegal settlers. And in almost all of the rural capitals where the illegal settlers are currently occupying, the rank and files of state administration are filled by people from the settlers. However, these were not enough for, for the vigilantes, as their demands are no simple administrative questions. You see, historians have rightfully documented um, since the conquest of Oromo into the Ethiopian Empire State in the late 19th century, how under the successive Ethiopian regimes, the Oromo have been in the Oromo have, been, have endured merciless violence and displacement from the land. So the current conflict in some ways is a continuation of the previous injustices and um, um, the pre previous speaker um, alluded to. I'll now list the key recent conflict in, in the steady area selected for presentation today. The first major conflict took place in 2001 when the settlers rejected the local government administration and it demanded a certain rule, which was followed by expelling Oromo from the vicinities. According to US State Department report published in 2001, over 10,000 people have been forcefully displaced due to the violence and over 500 houses were burned and more than 3,000 heads of cattle were stolen at that time. During this conflict and in all subsequent conflicts, the Oromo were outgunned by their counter you see, the successive Ethiopian regimes work in earnest to, to disarm the Oromo, even from carrying traditional spears. While to the contrary, the illegal settlers were armed to their teeth. This disproportionate armed distribution meant that the Oromo were very easy targets. Let me now skip forward and briefly touch on the recent attacks. In 2021, several rural cabalets in Jiddayana were attacked. Um, and just to cite a few of the most notable ones, um, on fe February 13, 2021, for instance, 14 people were killed in Andodidicho, Ali, and Doro over Rakabales. Their livestock were dri driven away and their houses burned down. On November 25, 2022, Pano killed 12 people, including members of the Oromia police. On, who were on the road to, uh, going to Hiramu district. 
On November 29, 2022, another indiscriminate killing took place in Kiramu district with a spillover effect in Jidda. Fano killed more than 20 people, including Kiramu district police first minister of court judge uh, named Dan Togameda. Residents and the government officials blame Fano. Local government level officials blame Fano for these indiscriminate attacks. For instance, Jidda Yana District Communication Bureau posted a text on their Facebook account as of December 2, 2022, and which reads, the Amara insurgents, Fano, have launched a military attack on civilians in Kiram District. The 19 villages in Kiram District of Tuala Gazo have been completely displaced, and many civilians were killed. Most of the displaced people have fled to Jidda Yana District, which is a neighborly district. And currently, the seat, the, the capital of the Diana district is hosting about 70,000 internally displaced people. On December 3, 2022, the Fano killed 69 Oromo and 13 Tagaru in Gutti. Um, and this includes, and as I've mentioned, used this in my other presentations as well, members of family of the current uh, Wallaga University president, who sadly noted on his Facebook account yesterday. Um, which is in December 3, 2022, in Guti town, eight of my relatives, including my brother-in-law, were brutally killed. Currently, as I noted in my introductory remark, out of the 32 Kabales in Jidayana district, Oromo have been completely expelled from 12. It is important to note that Fandu and Amara vigilantes attack on Oromo, irrespective of the religion or age or gender. Oromoness is the only factor that singles an individual out for an attack. Now let us move to why um, the Fano and Amara vigilantes. I make this, um, so to say, subtle distinction between Fano and Amara vigilantes because Fano mostly cross over from Amara region to Oromia, Oromia uh, while the Amara vigilantes are parts of the illegal settlers who reside within Oromia but they have singularity when it comes to the aim of their atrocities. There are two assumptions that seem to inform Pano and Amara vigilantes mobilization in Oromia. The first assumption, which has been used for decades now, is that the Amara elites regard the Oromo as inferior human beings. So anti-Oromo racism is fundamental part of their ideology. The second assumption is that they consider Wollega and for that matter, Oromia as no man's land that is up for grabs and waiting to be colonized. Several studies have documented the response settlers in Wollega. In response to the question, why did you migrate to Wollega? Most of them replied, Maret Lagna, to colonize land. And this has been documented by various scholars. With these assumptions and addressed with imperial ambitions, the aim of the Fano in Amara Vigilantes is for Metakal Zone from Benishangul to move, the district of Walkait and Raya from Tigray region, parts of Shua and parts of Wallega from Oromia to be placed under the greater Amara state, an extension of the imperial project. And this has been clearly stated by their political leaders and some of whom you can see from my slide now, for instance, mm -hmm. Major Daud clearly stated, clearly stated unequivocally that Wallega is an historical territory of the Amara, and therefore Fanos and Amara vigilantes mobilization is a rightful venture. One of the leaders of the Fano and who is currently operating in Wallega made a public statement that this is a statement he made in Bure. Bure is, um, few kilometers away from um, Kiramu. They say that the Amara went to Wallega in Oromia as if we went to another region. We didn't go to another region. Wallega is our own. It is our own Amara territory before the Oromo came. Wallega used to belong to us and we will reclaim it. And Fano's voice is an echo of their political leaders. Uh, for instance, um, Major Dowd in his uh, um, uh, interview with uh, Abebe Gala noted 
Wallega used to belong to the Amaharas. In addition to Wallega, I believe that Amara Fano will also reclaim all the territories that used to belong to the Amara, but currently are occupied by the Oro. And it should come, come at a surprise because um, several weeks ago, the leader, or I should say former leader of the Balderas party was caught red-handed um, in Buretao. And he was accused of um, ideologically brainwashing, brainwashing, mobilizing um, the Fano um, to commit atrocities in, um, in Eastern Wall, in Eastern Wall, like in Western Romania. Um, very sadly, also, of course, um, he was released um, a day or two after the detention. Despite all these atrocities, despite all these decades of violence against the civilian or almost in the area, government officials continue to praise Fano. Um, on December 6, for instance, December 6, 2022, just four days after the gruesome attack in, in Gutin, Prime Minister Abi delivered a speech at the Ethiopian parliament, during which time he said, Fano is a pride of Ethiopia. They fought heroically and will continue to fight. Fano deserves praise and our utmost respect. Now, the Fano and Amara Vigilante can be understood theoretically speaking as Nen states, new Nen state forms of power. And this has been an emerging area of study in political anthropology, where the understanding is this emerging Nen state of forms of power operate beside the state, not in contradiction with the state, beside the state, in interlacement with the state, and at times being financed and supported with the state, which is a, which is a case in um, Western Romania. Now, I will speak to why the Fano are so vicious and I'll draw on literature um, to support my argument. A glimpse at the literature shows that the Fano and Amara Vigilante share similar features with other paramilitary groups such as the Serb militias that fought alongside the Yugoslav government against the Croatian independence and the Janjaud militias who fought against the Darfur insurgents in Sudan. The Janjaud militia forces committed severe atrocities against civilians throughout the conflict. And um, there, ha there is um, a lot of literature, um, not just academic, but also from human rights organizations on this one. A striking similarity between the Serbian paramilitary and the Fano and the Amara vigilantes, in addition to their brutality, is that they both made territorial claims against all their neighboring ethnic groups. The Amara elites currently claim territory from Tigray, including Walk et Raya, from Benishan Gulgumuz, including Matakal, from Afar and from Oromia to create the grand ambition of a greater Amara state, which is a contemporary version of the imperial past. But very sadly, these atrocities are rarely reported in international media. The Oromo do not have influential friends in position of power among Oromo government or Western government and the Western media. And therefore, the sufferings of the Oromo have received little att international attention. This is the hallmark of invisibility at its best. I will try to speak briefly. Um, a concluding remark. And my concluding remark uh, goes beyond a simple conclusion to draw attention to um, policy implications. Um, the natural conclusion that I will draw from my presentation is the fact that the Fano and Amara vigilantes um, committed um, atrocious by, uh, um, crimes um, against the Oromo in Western Oromia. Um, with an objective of annexing these territories under the Greater Amara State, um, their grand ambition of creating a grand uh, Greater Amara State. Um, but I will be very much interested in drawing up uh, uh, policy implications. Um, short of any political recommendation, um, which would have been ideal given the circumstances, I will limit myself to speaking to um, policy issues. The first one, and which I believe um, should be done as a matter of urgency and a priority, is the need for conducting a landholding inventory 
um, in this contentious part of Oromia. As I've tried to mention in the, the history of settlement, Amara settlement in Western Oromia, the post-1991 settlers are illegal by definition because there was no state-supported inter-regional settlement program. And therefore, all illegal settlers should be responsibly removed from the lands they currently occupy. And this is not an outlandish uh, claim. Um, as currently, uh, for instance, in Hagar and the surrounding, um, the state is doing similar things to remove illegal settlers, illegal land occupiers, and to put back the land to the land bank. And illegal settlers are posing, at least in the context of Western Oromia, a security threat, not just to the integ territorial integrity of the Oromo and Oromia, but also to Benish Angul, for instance, and our other regional states within Ethiopia. And even the, the issue, the security issue in Western Oromia could pose a major um, security challenge in the in Blue Nile uh, River Basin, which, goes, which includes the major uh, mega development project. Okay, just 30 more seconds we can give you to wrap up, please. Yeah, um, the, um, the second point is um, all legally settled citizens um, within Oromia, in particular in Western Oromia, should be taught about Oromo values. Um, illegally occupying a territory is very alien to Oromo world view. Um, and therefore, it is my view and um, policy implication. Uh, I draw attention to um, that um, um, all legally settling, uh, legally settled um, Amahara need to be um, trained about um, values of Oromo of Oromumma, uh, so that they peacefully and smoothly coexist with fellow Oromos. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm sorry to share that we are missing two of our panelists for this session were unable to join us. So Gemetru Kadir and also Getana Chameda were unable to join for, for personal reasons. Um, which is why we luckily had some extra time for these previous participants. Um, but our, our next panelist is Ginbar Nagera, and I will let him introduce himself. So go ahead, Ginbar, whenever you're ready. Uh, you're muted now. You're still muted. So we cannot hear you. Can you hear us, Skimbar? So we still cannot hear you. I'm trying to unmute you, but it's not successful. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Now we can hear you. Wonderful. Okay. Do you, do you hear me? Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, my presentation is on one of the Karaju heroes, Arrode Fiche a symbol of resistance and uh, heroism in Karaju. I begin with uh, introducing the Karaju. Karaju belong to the Baron Tumma Confederacy and uh, organized into the Basso and the Dulecha. They claim that uh, they shared the ancient Romo mood and the Kada Gada centers such as Mormor, Madrolabu and the Fugu were their ancestral land as well. Karaju then, since the last part of the 16th century, established themselves uh, in the late Gada assembly at Malka or Tarre Lady and uh, Malka or Tarre Lugo, formerly Malka, but since the 1960s uh, named as uh, Tarre. 
they can tell you have uh, other historical landscapes such as Horasama, Odakalala, Jirenkara, and uh, Motomakorma. Introducing the Karayu further, uh, the Karayu are the guardians of ancient Oromo values, described as Ummata Horte Ganama, or people of the origin, because of their adherence to the Wakefana, the Da system, the pastoralism. The Karayu are still wearing the white kilt or Martuadi, and then for their Gunfra hairstyle, mimics of uh, the Oda tree. Really, then this is a part, the next is a part uh, regarding the Karayu account of resistance. Historical record that tells us that uh, the Karayu have come under the persistent victimization by the neighborhood Shawan Amara since the 18th century and their allies of the Ethiopian states as of the last quarter of the 20th century. So the Shawan Amara were an old force of the Karayu and they gave rise to Imperial Menelik, who conquered the Karayu land in 1887 or 88 and they achieve their long gold plans. So the second that it is allies drives for pressing the Karayu are been evicting them from their lands, abandoning the Geda system or abandoning them the Geda system, Wakefana and the Oromuma for the grand Amaranization in the supermassy of sedentary agriculture, weakening their military military courage. As Ababaira himself described the Karayu were most powerful and aggressive fighters of uh, Oromo branches. Here is a sort of uh, outline uh, which really didn't help me to uh, how really the resistances and the account the Karayu has come through. It is uh, among the combatants between the Karayu on one hand and their uh, neighborhood, the Shawan Amara in 1705. Nagasi Christos drove the Karayu from the main highland of Bulga when the Karayu were the Karayu Gada leader Bulga Fantale killed in the confrontation. In 1712, Sevisti again attacked the Karayu. In 1745, BJ fought with the Karayu at a place called Barri Akko or Ankover, and uh, BJ killed in the, front, in, the, in the confrontation by the Karayu heroes. 1800, Amaha Jesus attacked again, similarly attacked the Karayu, importing modern weapons from Gonda. 1820 and 13, Sahel Selassie launched two campaigns against the Karayu, uh, where really when he looted nearly 18,000 Karayu uh, cattle. 1815, similarly, Munich then looted 16 Karayu female and the children. Uh, later, the Karayu released uh, with uh, 100 fathom uh, bulls. Karayu again uh, confronted uh, with Ethiopian uh, state or government since uh, Menelik conquest. 1887 were their conquest by Menelik uh, when the Karayu then mutilated and the dead uh, breast is cut off. In the 1890s and then 1894, as Mangesha Atken was one of uh, general in Battle of Adowa, launched uh, four, that is a consecutive three or four years uh, attacks against the Karayu, with the Karayu called Lola Boda and the Lola and Naba Borchata. Uh, he looted the Karayu cutting. And the consequence of the Karayu says, uh, remembered this uh, confrontation as Gaha Karayu Kachenga Babat or Gaha Irumte. In 1999, they just uh, after Mariam took a land with them, uh, then really country kind of confronted for two days with the imperialist team. Again, uh, 1925, 27, 29, chapter one, uh, the country you confronted at Lola Gorda, Lola Gala, Lola Gala, Lola Hallam, Lola Indiba, where they uh, when the country you confronted uh, against the state allies. In 1935, um, uh, Karayu were really then severely beaten by Bakala Basha, an imperial, an imperial army at Arsia Saku. So Kala mobilized uh, nearly 700 well armed army against the Karayu. He himself uh, was uh, said to his uh, modern brain, like which Karayu called Matresi. Uh, 
similar than similar to Italian administration, Mr. Mitte Karayu, and then I was in last year, then Parsa two times. 1941, 41, I guess 1970 uh, at Matahara in, in public. Here is a, an, an outline or a table which shows a major incidents of battles since 1890s. Here are a list of battles uh, which my current informants uh, uh, telling me or told me uh, how deleted and persecuted and uh, persistently attacked by Ethiopia, the state and the allies. The country you have been uh, prey to the coming and the going regimes, deliberate repression, alleged beautiful persistence and the uh, extinction. They are struggling for survival under the persistent attacks has shaped the country account of oppression, resistance and uh, heroism. So sell their self-defense valor, forced the cultivation of heroism and the venerated heroes uh, like Arrola. Can you really then uh, uh, <clears throat> in superseding the Baron II Confederacy in the 16th century, whom Babaira himself mentioned them as the most uh, bravest and uh, uh, fighting class uh, are nowadays uh, portrayals of uh, marginalized. So they are really then uh, overlooked in Oromo scholarship, national patriotism, literature, and art or music due to uh, little research access. Um, a methodology, uh, I uh, use this historical. Particularly my informant are the leading witness of uh, their history or my history. It is a military structure or a sort of a structure which shows you how the country were militarily organized and their GEDA system, uh, which is led by the Ababoku. The, the Ababarana is accountable to lead the general military divisions. The Jajabi is a police department, and the Waratoma are those who are guarding the Baboku and the seat or center of political administration. The Karayu again have their own military code and the principle. The military principle indoctrinated that the Karayu never withdraws from an enemy, never subdues his position to rivals. The military uh, motto Starborn is pledged to. Commando. You always, they say, fight always your enemy anterior, and they die step forward. Karayu again use motto as Tarre Radin and Desanor. The Karayu never retreats an enemy from a Tarre or an assembly unless to die on it. So again, they adopt the philosophy of keeping female children all beyond uh, the war zone. Here is a military structure uh, adopted uh, among the Karayu. Uh, Karayu have a common fighting class. All Karayus uh, engaged in fighting as long as they are very few in number. And then uh, almost annihilated uh, through this historical lectures uh, and the uh, war of annihilation on them. The special fighting class are Lencha Karayu, or like the commandos. The next are, uh, is the Kondala or the Abandriga, and the, the most bravest and the, the one who collected more Koki is said as Ababita or a superhero. But the, even when the bravery and the super the military titles in Kavayu is, is Kondala. In the conventional Gada system, Kondala is a fourth age grade. Abahire mentioned the Kondala were an army uh, section. Similarly, the Karayu Kondala stands for someone of best warrior and the war did in troop. The Lenjo Karayu are the lions of Karayu, refer to those who are roaring like lions and upsetting fear on their enemy. These are, uh, uh, here is um, photos then. Uh, I took in 2018 These are uh, the Kondalas on military spectacle. So you see uh, the Kondalas with uh, female or women attire or clothes. What really distinguishes uh, heroes or a Kondala in Karayu? The Karayu say that the Kondala or hero is born naturally. Is someone who naturally born, uh, the heroes and the heroically die. Hero buried in a special place or a particular site. 
on where on his uh, hero is on whose burial site the grass grows. The cattle then graze that uh, grass. Then the cattle gives milk. The one who drink that uh, milk always grows to be hero. So this is how the hero, the heroism is uh, cycling and the recycling in Karayu. The Kondalas are again distinct for their military decorations. They wear the Bobesitu, it's a red uh, string tied on their head, the Jano, the Burcha, the Bali, and the Tibayu. Here are uh, clothes uh, which are really distinct and uh, only worn by the, the Kondala and uh, which distinct them from a common uh, fighting and uh, then Kondalas. Kondalas are distinct uh, for their, uh, because of their military technologies. They always uh, wear shade spear or guns. The Kundalas are the more rewarded classes who really then uh, bore materially as well as uh, socially. They are uh, pride of uh, their people. The head being a good warrior uses fear and the left psychological impact against and then he can. Their prerogatives of Kundala, they are always entitled to take the best food. Their achievement is recited through Farsa and the Gerarsa, move the people with tears of joy, and then these are uh, uh, really then uh, uh, the prerogative uh, to which the Kundala is entitled in Who oh, really then a role of uh, a role is said to be born in 1880s and uh, died in 1976. Role was an extraordinary full life fighter and who collected six trophies in life. He said to be having involved in 12 of the major battles, probably you for its uh, Ethiopia and the state and its allies, and he wounded nine times. He was a Bajajabi during uh, the 1923 to 1930s. This was based on the Geda timetable or chronology. He became the Bawarana, commander in chief of army or for his, his Mitchell party. He won again for the position or office of uh, Abba Thomas Way. He was the best advisor on military and security matters after he joined the Luba or in, after 1946. Your extraordinary led the Kavayu fighters on several emergency confrontations. He also frequently chosen among his peers, friends, and uh, class for surprise attack. I want to record for his relentless bravery, military tactics, determination, and the quality of two organized fighters and the manipulating the horse. They are able to fight on horseback uh, until the 1960s and the 70s. He was known by his horse name, named Rebu and the Abba Rebu. He was the best trainer of youth with the management of horse, spear management, swords, and uh, others. A role is again the equivalence of uh, other extraordinary heroes of the Karayu. Era Jilo, his best fighter and uh, best fighter and his fr best friend, Antale Bukuri, who said to have smiled three enemies in one battle. It is Awako, Awas Jidda, Awas, the one who killed Bakala Basha and uh, confiscated his matrezi or the brain guy. Then a role, uh, the call for his. Uh, in extraordinary achievements uh, on the day of Lola Galcha in 1931. On the day when the Karayu fighters returned from uh, combat, they found an enemy ambushed under the tree. No one really then dared to challenge except a role. So he chased that enemy and uh, dragged him from his horse. So he is remembered as Galcha and Dari Lafa and the following song Galcha and Dari Lafa, Arada Onasumale. Ichiki Fiche, Father Rafa de Utale, Rada Kiteloni, Fardan Fardakabe, a role Fiche. Role is uh, remembered uh, with his deeds on the day of his active Gada Power, 1939, uh, when uh, Role confronted uh, on the day while heroes from all over Baso Dulacha Moitis made war enchantment at Tarelugo. Then I only confronted them and uh, queried all of them saying, have you conquered the horse? Did your horse capture an enemy source or horse by horse? There was nobody that matched him from entire Karayu land. He remained to be a much less hero. 
This is a Kaaba monument uh, built for Karayu, built for Arole in 1976. Arole is the only hero for whom Karayu built such a memorial tomb stone. For the rupees, six rupees he collected. And as you see from uh, the photo, uh, two of the longest on left and the sides are uh, their heroes like Arole himself. The remaining were uh, the common fighters. So he did it uh, as uh, six trophies. Arole's and uh, uh, Onu's monuments. Uh, uh, still the sacrificial uh, honor is made. The Jews uh, go to that site and they say, sacrifice, pay sacrifice uh, in goat or sheep or many bulls then slaughtered in the name of Karayu. So uh, for his achievement and the contributed deeds, he is uh, remembered in praising Songisas. Uh, so this is, uh, you are always encouraged to listen heroic stories and uh, continuously thoughts about each of these uh, celebrated words like uh, Karayu. This is a conclusion. Uh, Karayu experienced the state and it is a uh, lies victimization, land confiscation, looting victims and uh, livestock and uh, slaying their great fighters. They are also struggling to survive the dry and the arid ecology of Antalya area along with their eviction from Awash body. The result of uh, this uh, persistent war, if you really they give you an example, a tangible example, the Basso mighty Moiti Melba party, Boku family has lost, totally lost it is uh, Boku family, and uh, it is office for the uh, last party tenure, 2009, 11 to 18, was almost back the Basso, Melba Party has not totally lost its Boko family because of this persistence attacks and the wars on Karayu. Again, Just in 19... a two minute warning. Yeah, I'm finishing. Yeah. 1930s, near to 40 to 50 members of the Mitchell Day Party were encircled and slaughtered at one day. Only five to seven were saved from the massacre. Then the last Karayu, Zerto maintained Gada and Wakefana without yielding to Amaranization. Christianization as well as Islamization. In the Oromo history of resistance against prejudices, the Karayu would come in first line, firmly sustaining Oromo and then unyielding to an aligned influence. Survival became possible through the reliance on Gada's strong institutional support and their strong determination, their adherence to Akefana, the consciousness for Oromo, strong internal solidarity drawing on proven military organizations and their strategies. However, the Karayu stamina has faced the challenge since very recently because of the increasing state annihilation, growth, and the change in agency. Since 1970, when the Karayu are in the middle of crisis, certain government, governmental actors in the name of humanitarian access view the vacuum as an opportunity to dump their creeds, the two weekend gather values. Oh, this is the recommendation that I made. The Ethiopian government should bureaucratize Israel itself from annihilating the Karayu who are under ex existential threat. Again, the uh, strategy of using Afanoromo as a church language and encouraging the Rus to rebel over deserting ancestral value of Gada and the Oromoma needs to be halted. The Council of Aboti Gada and the similar institutions like OSA need to boldly speak on such religious imposture and establish a strong agency design a strategy safeguarding Oromumma. A roles monument, which is, could be the first monumental memorial for Oromo heroes, standards and open space has no fences in the protected so that it could be easily affected. So the Fantale district, culture and tourism shall establish a protection strategy to conserve this uh, the monument. Here is a dedication uh, page, a tribute to the Lake Ababoku, Kadro Hawas. I owe and give Fanna or Wakefana according to religious rule uh, to the Lake Ababoku, Kadro Hawas, and his cabinet of the Chile Party. This uh, acknowledgement, I acknowledge Hawas uh, Roba, the Hawas Meto of Karayu's nephew, 
እንደ ኢልማን ካራዩ ነብሮድ አትባል ሊሩከሳ ወሩ እንደ አዋስ ቴንክ ዩ ወንደርፉል ቴንክ ዩ ሶ ማች ኪንባር ቴንክ ዩ ኦኬ ኤንድ आवर ፋይናል ፓኔሊስት ፎር ቱዴይ ኢዝ ማርጋ ፈካዱ ሁይ ቢሊቭ ኢዝ ኦሬዲ ሂር So Marga is a lawyer by training. He holds an LLM master's in human rights law and LLB degree in law, both from Addis Ababa University. Currently, he is a lecturer of law at Walkite University. He's participated in various research and has published four articles on different topics. He also considers himself a human rights advocate working with CSOs on human rights issues. So we are happy to have you Marga. Okay, so can you uh, unmute yourself Marga so we can test? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, um uh, I am uh, really honored to be a part of this conference uh, you know uh, I am it is my first time uh, to participate in OSAS conference and uh, today I'm going to present on uh, the Ethiopian judiciary plight and right of Roma political prisoners a critical analysis of some some cases so to begin from uh, some uh, uh, from, from the definition of the phrase political prisoners Uh, political prisoners are those who are detained um, in against the violation of uh, international human rights law and uh, in some cases because of their political views or their membership to um, ethnic groups nationality or or based on their language so i adopted uh, i took this definition from from uh, two uh, organizations uh, definitional uh, definitional thing which is amnesty international and uh, and and uh, oh, really European... quick, sorry to interrupt but can you can you make your slides full screen or can you just zoom in a little bit so we can see it larger sorry so just in the bottom right hand corner i think if you can make your zoom yeah just to 100% or as, as big as you can okay uh yeah i think wonderful thank you so much Yeah so uh, uh the political prisoners are those who are uh, detained or arrested against the violation of international human rights law and uh, having political view is uh, not necessarily a criteria uh, because uh, the way the government or the security forces perceive the a person uh, matters uh, you know in especially in Oromia uh, people are detained not uh, simply uh, because of their political views but uh, because of their membership to oromia uh, oromo or or oromo group or oromo nation uh, by by saying this uh, i will go to the objective of the article uh, and the the article has two two objectives mainly uh, it examines the human rights situation of oromo political prisoners and it also examines the state or the, the position of uh, ethiopian judiciary from a political prisoners uh, perspective uh and uh, the research adopted uh, a, a kind of mixed um, doctrinal and then uh, doctrinal legal research method uh and uh, uses qualitative research approach in in analyzing the the data and uh, the international and national legal instruments uh, are analyzed uh, uh, primarily uh, the cases uh, uh, court cases and uh, uh, international human rights laws uh, such as uh, iccpr the fdr constitution and the all, all uh, other uh, laws uh, uh, secondary sources are also consulted uh, reports from uh, ngos media outlets books and articles were utilized and the the conclusion of uh, and the recommendation of the article is informed by this this data so uh, coming to the the human rights uh, framework in which we study uh, prisoners uh, right political prisoners right we have uh, udhr uh, universal declaration of human rights iccpr 
Convention Against Torture, African uh, Charter on Human and People's Rights Convention uh, related to the forced disappearance of people, and other international instruments such as a guideline that is adopted by by African Union. Uh, more or less, uh, Ethiopia is party to all of them, uh, and. You've muted yourself somehow. We cannot hear you. Can you? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. So these are the international uh, instruments uh, from which we drive uh, political uh, prisoners' rights. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there are uh, in, in international human rights law, we have uh, entitlement to fair and public hearing as, as independent and uh, uh, human right by its own rights. Uh, and uh, so in part, getting your case heard by uh, impartial and, uh, independent tribunal by itself is a right. So this requires the, the independent, independent judiciary and the impartial, uh, impartial uh, uh, judges who, who entertain the cases. So uh, when we say judicial independency, uh, it can be measured against the quality of uh, lawyers or judges that, that uh, handle cases and the, the financial and the political autonomy of uh, the, the, the courts. Uh, on top of this, the finality of the court decision, the fact that the, the decision passed by court are final uh, and not subjected to revision by other, other uh, branches of government also uh, is one of the manifestation of uh, uh, an independency of judiciary. Uh, we're coming to the, the context of political prisoner uh, and from uh, starting from the historical uh, perspectives, uh, Oromos are uh, subjected to a marginalization, uh, subjected to economical, uh, economic, political, and other mar marginalizations and exclusions. Uh, since their uh, subjugation and uh, annex annexation to the Ethiopia uh, by use of forces by uh, by the Minilik. And we have uh, many of sources uh, on, on, on this regard. Uh, they, they are mar marginalized and oppressed, and uh, it continued under uh, the successive uh, Ethiopian regimes. We have uh, human rights violations targeting Oromo politicians and Oromo elites during Haile Selassie's regime. And uh, as uh, cited in uh, Professor Asafa Jalata's article, Mamo Mazamr and Ma Ma Haile Maram Gamada, where uh, Oromo elites were subjected to uh, uh, illegal uh, arbitrary detention and uh, other human rights abuses during Haile Selassie's regime. And uh, during the Dergi regime, also, there were systematic uh, oppression and repression of Oromo. Uh, Oromo society, Oromo nation, uh, under the Red Terror campaign. And it is also continued during the EPRDF regime, uh, which, which labeled the whole Oromo nation as OLF and uh, uh, detained in mass and, uh, and the torture and extrajudicially killed uh, in, in thousands. Uh, uh, so it, it is a continuation, in fact. And uh, uh, here I want to cite the, the recent uh, uh, Joar Mohammadi's note, uh, which, say, which says, which characterizes uh, the name under which Oromo uh, have been suffering from, from the inception. Uh, so Shifta during the Haile Selassie regime, uh, Wombade during the Derg, and the terrorists during the, the uh, EPRDF regime, and, uh, and the Shani during the PP regime. So, uh, the, when we see the, tra the trajectory, it is a continuation, uh, and uh, the, 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 the Ethiopian Empire uh, was uh, targeting and, uh, and uh, eliminating and as well uh, oppressing the Oromo nation, and it is elite. Uh, in, in 2080, uh, the PP regime, uh, which came into power by based on the, the uh, Oromo revolution or Oromo protest, use protest, uh, tried to uh, make some um, some some reforms, some legal and institutional ref uh, reforms, which include the revision of anti-terrorism proclamation, election proclamation, and the media laws. 
and institutional wise, uh, there were an attempt to to revise the uh, election board and the human rights commission and uh, uh, other other institutions, including courts. Uh, there were reports uh, that claim uh, over uh, 3,000 of political prisoners were released during that time. Uh, uh, the political uh, space was said to be widened, and uh, some 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 uh, political labeling uh, was lifted from oil and Gimbo uh, Sabat at the time. But this uh, didn't last long. Uh, while uh, 3,000 uh, 3, uh, prisoners released, the Abiy regime or the PP regime uh, arrested tens of thousands thousand of Oromo politi politicians uh, or uh, some even not politicians the ordinary uh, citizens as well and uh, so what we see from this is that uh, it can be concluded by this uh, maxim which says the more it changes the more it remains the same the situation uh, the, there were attempts there were um, attempts to to reform the law the institution but uh, it is still the same and uh, coming to the plights of uh, Oromo political prisoners and in Ethiopia, uh, mass arrest is common. Uh, people are uh, deta detained uh, even even in schools uh, because the prison facilities were um, not enough to, to, to hold the large number of Oromo politica uh, political uh, prisoners. And uh, we have both an official and official uh, prison centers in Ethiopia. And uh, currently, as report claims, reports claim, we have uh, tens of thousands of uh, political prisoners. Uh, these are those who, who registered some of them. And uh, uh, this is the situation. And uh, what are the cause of uh, the causes for the arrest in Ethiopia? Having the link to OLA, this is a name or the pretext under which everybody can be arrested on, on his way. And uh, having relatives uh, who are a member of OLA, uh, this is uh, the, the, the main cause. Uh, you know, as many of you can remember, uh, the OLA leader, uh, Jalmar Ro's family, uh, was uh, intimidated and harassed simply because uh, uh, they are uh, the parents of uh, Marro. Uh, and the local militia didn't use checking their ID. Uh, you know, in some cases, uh, they they want to know your uh, locality from, from which part of Roma you came. And uh, because of your locality, you can be uh, subjected to imprisonment. Local militia also can detain you if they want uh, some sort of money from you. And uh, if you have a personal uh, conflict with them, this can be uh, a person can be ended up into jail because of these factors in Romania. And, uh, and uh, as the Ethiopian law says, uh, criminal responsibility is personal and uh, there is no 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 uh, need to uh, imprison parents for for the the crime of uh, other, other their relatives if, if it is uh, a crime at all. And uh, to, to, to uh, uh, categorize the, the plights of Oromo political prisoners into these thematic areas. Uh, extrajudicial killing is rampant. Enforced disappearance is common. Violation of right to fair and public hearing, torture and inhuman treatments are uh, the, the major uh, uh, right violations that the people are facing in, in, in prison. So uh, coming to the extrajudicial killing, uh, Human right to life is protected under international law and uh, Ethiopian domestic laws as well. And uh, hundreds of uh, political prisons are executed after they removed from, from uh, the place where they detained or arrested. We have uh, many reports, as I collected, uh, you know, from, uh, from, from civil society organization report, including OLA and uh, OSG and HALA. Uh, we have Ab Abdi Ababe, uh, he, he was a um, freshman university student and uh, executed in, in uh, Amuru after uh, uh, detained for three or, or uh, two days, I think. Demis Moisa was also uh, disappeared at the first and uh, executed later. And uh, the Amanuel Wendimus case is uh, very common. I think uh, you, you all uh, know it. And uh, 
the the, the government officials are proud uh, about the execution of this guy. They publicly executed on in Dambidolo. So uh, in addition to this, uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a workshop uh, prepared by local NGO uh, in Ethiopia, and uh, uh, the the participants were from Guji, from East and West Guji zones, and uh, they they told us that there is a place uh, specifically called Kera and the network. These places are notorious places where the people were uh, were the political detainees or arrested persons taken and uh, executed if if, if uh, the, the the they went the 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 security uh, personnel went to execute them. Uh, this report is also corroborated by Amnesty International uh, report of 2029. Uh, two minors, uh, Abdullah and Deganke was uh, executed after they removed from, from detention uh, centers. And uh, according to international law, uh, minor uh, cannot be subjected to capital punishment even if, if the, the court cannot even decide uh, the, their execution. Uh, the other uh, one is enforced disappearance. This is common and uh, a single person can be subjected to multiple enforced disappearance at a time. Uh, so it is well known when it comes to OLF and the OFC um, leaders and members. The process of law uh, is violated, uh, and this includes the detention uh, from from the very outset. Uh, the people arrested again the violation of law uh, the, without having court warrant. It is common, uh, so no one is entitled to ask uh, the the court order from the security person. Uh, after the detention, they. Uh, Denied of uh, the right to be presented to court within 40, 48 hours. And when it comes to the uh, bail, uh, firstly, the, the amount the court decide is uh, exaggerated uh, and uh, uh, the, it, it ranges from 25,000 to 50,000 50, uh, per, per, uh, per person. And uh, the, the sad part is after they uh, pay this, uh, this uh, amount of money, uh, the security forces either load an appeal against them or uh, wait them and, at the gate of the prison and uh, take them, rearrest them and transfer to another prison. This, this is what is commonly uh, practiced in this country. And uh, even uh, the, the security personnel or the prison administration uh, people can refute the court order and. Uh, uh, keep the political prisoner in in, in prison uh, despite the court order. And uh, finally, the no one uh, can get the back payment, the, the payment the, the, that they, they pay uh, for their bail. And uh, when we see this, it seems like that the government is using as a revenue generating mechanism and economically empowering the political uh, prisoners. Uh, I am saying this because uh, many of the political detainees here are, uh, some of them are students, recent graduate, and uh, the other are uh, those who uh, lived all of their life in, polit in, in for the for the struggle Oromo cause uh, for the for the Oromo cause in in uh, other countries. So when the court decides fifty thousand beer to them, it's a bit difficult to afford. It amounts to denial of. Uh, the, the bare rights. Uh, the other human rights violation is uh, torture and inhuman in treatment and uh, interna an international law torture is strictly prohibited. Uh, even during the state of emergency, uh, no one can, can uh, no, no one should be uh, inhumanly treated or tortured. But this is common, uh, and uh, I have a list of uh, survivors of uh, torture and inhuman treatment. Uh, some of them are in this country, and some of them are abroad, uh, living in exile. Uh, so uh, we have Rabra, Wirtu, uh, Mangistu, Akma, Mamad, Dexiso, Kulani, uh, Bagre, who was still in, in prison, and uh, the, court, the court convicted her. Uh, but she's suffering a health problem, uh, which is due to the torture. Uh, 
Just to give and, you two more minutes, please, to wrap up. Okay. So, Galan and the Sololia, uh, uh, Galan, Sololia, and Awash Malkas are the centers, the new center serving as a torture center for this regime. And uh, denial of human uh, medical treatment is also uh, one of the uh, inhuman treatment in, 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 in the prison. The other important thing is that the role of the court and uh, the it, it, the courts are usually regarded as the guardian of human rights. They protect uh, citizens from uh, excessive use of force from from executive side. But uh, in Ethiopia, courts are so weakened uh, that they cannot even enforce their order. Uh, the police, the ordinary police, is uh, can refuse the court order to execute the court order. Uh, by by citing the order from above, you know we have a uh, order uh, which is a uh, above court order. These orders are usually from uh, police commission or security forces. And uh, coming to the conclusion, uh, Oromo political prisoner has been subjected to right abuses, uh, as I have just mentioned, uh, which include extrajudicial killing, torture, inhuman treatment, enforced disappearance, and other abuses. This uh, violation are systematic and gross, and uh, the Ethiopian justice system is not working. The, the courts are not independent, and uh, they cannot even execute their order. Uh, so, uh, the, the targeting of Oromo politician is not something that started during PP's regime; rather, it is a continuation of a colonial project, which is which started from 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 uh, the since the colonization of uh, Oromo land by uh, Minilik. So uh, the problem is inherent to the structure of the, the state, the state by itself. It is not uh, the, the government, but the, the formation of the state by itself is a problem. So uh, as, a, as a recommendation, uh, there is a need to renew uh, the social contract via mechanism of uh, either referendum or political transition, which must be followed by transitional justice to ensure uh, accountability and redress victims. Uh, and the, the right violation in Oromia is invisible. They are underreported. Uh, I know some of the NGO civil society organizations based in Ethiopia and abroad are working, but uh, it is still uh, underreported. The international community is not working on it. Uh, therefore, uh, radicalized advocacy and accountability measures are required. Working with the uh, UN and African Hum uh, Union uh, Human Rights Agency helps as well. Uh, and the, the other important thing I suggest here is the strategic litigation of cases uh, at the African Human and the People's Commission. Because uh, Ethiopia is party to the, the commission, uh, the charter and uh, the commission has to care has a mandate to, to, to entertain cases. This is expected from uh, civil society organizations. And finally, uh, I suggest that uh, well, there is a need to have a vibrant, uh, vibrant civil society organizations and uh, empowering the existing one is, uh, is a solution. Uh, it, it contributes. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. So now we will begin with the Q&A. Um, and same as previously, we will begin with participants in the room. And then we will take questions uh, from the Zoom participants. So if you are on Zoom, feel free to write questions in the chat now. Uh, but we will begin in the room. So any questions for our panelists? Okay, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I would like to have a, a question to, to Dr. Dr. Gamacho. Um, he has uh, stated uh, that Amara elites uh, claim that certain parts of Oromia are parts of Amara or Amara risk. Um, when, uh, for example, uh, David Olegiorg is uh, unequivocally states that Wallaka is Amara's uh, land, is there any grain of evidence 
uh, that Amaras ever lived in Walaga before the colonial invasion uh, by uh, Nukuste Klaimanot and later Minlit. And the second, uh, maybe, uh, how are, who is going to remove these illegal settlers? Thank you. Um. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, do you wanna go ahead and respond or should we collect a few questions first? Why, why don't you go go ahead and respond if you you seem ready ready to to add. Um, um, first of all, let me say thank you very much for uh, a very um, timely question, and I think um, the question um, <clears throat> uh, more than an answer. I'll, I'll leave it on on the table for everyone. Um, there are no historical. Uh, I'm not an historian. Um, I will not claim to be one. Um, but there are no historical facts to speak to the idea that um, the Amara have historically dominated that area. Um, these are what um, uh, anthropologists call the invention of tradition, um, the invention of narratives to justify a political objective. Um, and this is not specific to what like, I have tried to allude to in my presentation. Um, the Amara elite, um, have territorial ambition um, to take um, territories from all their neighboring uh, regional states in Ethiopia, not just in Ethiopia, actually, um, even in, in Sudan and in Djibouti. Um, so these are invented narratives to justify the political objective um, to resuscitate um, their imperial project. Um, but it is also in, informed by a very racist idea that any land outside of um, Amara regional state is a no man's land. And therefore it is a no point for them whether they have lived in, in those lands before or not. Um, and this has, this has informed all the successive policies introduced by the Ethiopian um, government. Um, that, for instance, land in Urumia is a no man's land. It is a marginal land. It is unused land, um, despite the fact to the contrary. Um, with that, I will leave it on the table. I'm hoping others to intervene as well and hoping uh, for historians to respond as well. The argument about who should remove, um, and there is one point which I haven't included in my presentation today. Um, in 2001, when the first major um, conflict broke out, I I was born in Jiddayana or Jidda. Um, so I remember, and um, the head of Oromia uh, Security um, Bureau uh, came, um, and he realized that um, the third wave of settlers all of them are illegal settlers, by the way, and there, is, there shouldn't be any question about that. These are illegal settlers, um, and there are no justifications to the contrary, despite the fact that there are ways by which they manufactured documents to claim that they are legal settlers. They are illegal settlers. So there was an attempt by um, Ethiopian government, sorry, or maybe the regional government itself, um, to push for um, a sort of managed um, removal, uh, which uh, costed his position. Uh, I, I forgot his name. Um, uh, Jonathan De Pesa, yes, Jonathan De Pesa tried um, to introduce, having, having seen on the ground the realities. Um, he tried to introduce that, but I think uh, it costed him his position and he had to flee the country. But this has to be done as a matter of security necessity, to be honest, as a security necessity. Um, nobody knows the exact number of illegal settlers in Western, in, in Eastern Olega, in Western Romia. Nobody knows. And they are not under um, state administration. And it has to be done. When I spoke about my conclusion, I started by saying short of political recommendation because we can have a long discussion about policy discussions here, but the anchoring point will go back to the politics, unless the politics is corrected, unless 
Oromia is ruled by a legitimate government. Um, we can have as a list, as, as many lists of policy recommendations as possible, but nobody to uh, um, implement them. So it has to be done, but it has to be done by uh, a legitimate government, uh, Oromia government. That's what I will say, but I will leave the, the discussion back on the table. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Did any of the other panelists want to respond to that question, or should we take a new question from the audience? Okay, let's take one more from the audience. Sorry, I saw Obu Gazao first, and we'll take yours next. Okay, we'll come to your comment after, if that's okay. All right, yeah, let's move on. I would like to thank all presenters and really it is well presented, but I have some clarifications actually, if you be able to do that. First of all, I would like to thank Kabane uh, for your presentation. Uh, well, with the kind of justice and you categorized justice into moral and illegal. And at the same time, you told us that who is responsible for the violation of human rights? And then you categorized three, four, sorry, four categories, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me. Power, privilege, interest, and collective ability. So what my question is, where does the Ethiopian politicians or Oromos lie in this one, by the way? Because I didn't see anything where they are actually, where they belong or how do they act in these categories, in these four categories. The other one is actually, uh, goes to yeah, the history of migration. Uh, I don't know who was that, maybe get much writing, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, you told us at the same time, I have a parallel question with the previous one. Well, you told us about the historical background of settlement, but your main discussion was based on settlement and violation, I think. And I didn't hear you much from the violence perspective, whether you have explored something. Is there any historical background of the violation acted upon the Oromos around there? Say, for instance, in my lived experience, I can see 1994, the Gala Gadai movement. And at the same time from that Gala Gadai developed into the current Fano. And if you have come across those facilities which helped the Fano, such as the Orthodox Church, as a store of armament, have you ever actually come across this evidence in your research? And the other one is, uh, well, I would like to thank Gumbar for his presentation, really. I have no comment or I have no question regarding that. Uh, regarding the Gada, sorry, the Karayu. Uh, yeah. Okay, can, why don't we pause there, Obo Gazelle? That's okay. We'll pause and have a response yeah. from those questions and then we'll go okay. forward. I'd like to piggyback onto the question for Kabane. Thank you very much for, for an excellent presentation. You made a legal distinction between those who are accountable and those who are responsible. So the question was about the responsibility and I'm interested in the distinction that you make there. What is the significance of that legal distinction? So go ahead uh, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you very much. Those are all great questions. So, um, and a bit philosophical. So maybe I'll start with the la last one with Boni's question. Um, so the divide between accountability and responsibility, both in the, in the legal, but also political philosophy is still debatable, but the very generalistic response to that would be, when we speak of accountability, it is often in the legal category of holding somebody to account. And to account is to demand, it can be in a form of compensation, for example, or in a form of demanding them to stop a certain form of wrongful behavior. And these forms of accountability are usually 
decided by the court of law. So the court can pass a verdict or um, a decision that requires a person to take a certain measure um, with regard to his or her or her wrongful behavior. And um, now I, I, I used Young's account of responsibility versus accountability. So when she defines the divide, she puts this, if we are speaking about accountability, then that is a legal accountability, which requires compensating, um, at least taking some sort of action to remediate the wrongful behavior. But then if we are talking about responsibility, it's not necessarily, first of all, it's not about blaming the actor or the wrongdoer, rather it's about um, requesting and collaboratively asking the, uh, the, that agent to somehow amend and revise the wrongful behavior. In this context, it's not about demanding compensation, for example. It's not about undoing the past injustice, rather it is about looking forward for a better future to improve the existing system together, collaboratively. So this is what the kind of differentiation Young draws. So uh, the back for the back, the forward looking element of responsibility and then the backward looking aspect of accountability. But as I say, it's quite debatable. So the space is still under debate, but this is the, the, the divide. And my presentation was more inclined to the responsibility uh, aspect than the accountability. I don't know if that answers, but yeah. Um, that maybe I'll, 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 I'll pass to, to the, the first question. So I think the first question has two aspects, if I understood this correctly. So the divide I drew between moral and legal uh, isn't just about justice. I was more about human rights. When we see and understand human rights, there are two dimensions of understanding human rights. One is human rights as a legal claim which is a positivist thinking and a positivist school of thought. So human rights emanates from the written law, from a written treaty. That is the legalistic thinking and understanding of human rights. And those, the, the second category, the moral claim, is the naturalist school of thought thinking and understanding of um, human rights, which claims that human rights goes beyond the positivist law. It is a fundamental right that we have by being just a human being. So our humanity um, enables us to have that right, and it's a right that, it, that that is not something that we claim or demand from a government. We have it by our by, by being just a human being. So that's the divide, and justice follows that. Then comes the question of justice. Um, when we demand justice, if we follow the positivist thinking and the legalistic claim, then we follow the procedural requirement of like the judiciary in those things. But then if we, we base our argument and claim on the moral angle of human rights, then it goes beyond that. Of course, recognize the role of judiciary, but it goes beyond that. Um, so that is the kind of line I wanted to drive. To, to, to draw. Uh, the second dimension of the question is really difficult. I think where do we stand, like uh, with re where do the Oromo polity politicians stand in those four parameters? And uh, so I, I would ask two questions for this. I mean, which politicians, that is really critical question, whom are we talking about? Because there are several actors, there are several politicians. So depending on the position they occupy, for example, some of them, they are in a power position. Uh, Oromo has been part of an Oromo has been in a certain form of power position since, since the historical period until today. Then so the kind of responsibility for those groups will be somehow they have the resource and also the leverage and control to influence the existing system because they are actually part of the system. So they have the, the, the larger responsibility. But then there are also pol Oromo politicians who are also at the victim category, right? And then what is, we can also think of their responsibility based on interest as recipients of the injustice, then they have the responsibility to, to, to co co 
co co coordinate their efforts and also raise and uh, a demand and against the system. Um, um, the same thing was 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 collective action, the collective capacity. So I would say the oral, the place of the oral politicians are at the intersection of all those parameters, and it's difficult to identify just one and say this is their place. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that response. Uh, shall we go to Gemetu? I think you had some comments. Yes, um, thank you. Um, very, very good questions again. Um, I will last with the la I will start with the last question about the role of the church. Um, and I would like to put that in a bigger context, um, how um, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church um, is related within the bigger uh, Ethiopian um, imperial political project, uh, even in the contemporary dis discourses. And Western Romania is no exception in that regard. Um, I can give you an, an example where um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church is a party um, siding with um, the uh, Pano Amara Vigilantes. Um, real lived experience example I will give you is from 2001. People who are from that area who follow event from that area will all remember when the um, a church in um, at Ayana, which is a capital of Gidda, uh, where um, a number of um, arms were found within the church compound, um, which resulted in actually um, detention of several of the, um, the clergy. Um, and this, um, this will not be an isolated event. Um, so it has to be an understood with the with bigger historical, but also contemporary context of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church relationship with the Ethiopian imperial past or um, current um, Ethiopianist ambition. So um, they have a part in it. The issue of how um, the Amara Vigilantes fund or metamorphosed over time, um, it is true um, when it started, um, there were um, several groups operate with different names. Um, I know, for instance, the case for um, Gala Gedai, who were financed and armed um, with um, um, uh, business owners, for instance. And this very rampant in, in, in the first round of the conflict, by the way. And even there were academics who tried to justify the position of legal settlers. I don't want to name names today. For anyone who is interested, I will give you the name of some of the books who were, that were published um, to justify the narrative of the illegal settlers. But um, around 20 years ago, when it started, it started with um, the kinds of the gun. Like Over time, it kind of ev evolved into Amara Vigilantes. And it's very recently that we have, and I want to make that distinction. The Fano are armed groups that are trained in Amara or even beyond. And now there are claims that they were even trained in Eritrea, trained and financed, and were sent to Oromia with a clear political uh, objective, with clear political purpose to clear Oromo of this land and annex this land part to the Amara. And they work in collaboration with Amara vigilantes. These are armed groups from within the illegal settlements. And then you have the, if you want to make a finer subtle distinction, the Gallagada actually are those who came decades ago, descendants of those who came decades and decades ago, and who um, kind of form um, a collaboration with the other groups. Um, with the same objective of creating an Amara domination in that region. So it has metamorphosed over time, but the objective remains the same. The actors have changed their names, the objective has remained the same. What is really sad actually is um, how both the Ormian National Regional State and the Ethiopian federal government work in collaboration with these groups to displace the Oromo. And you remember, one of the quotations from Fikadu um, the current uh, uh, Prosperity Party Oromia branch head, and how he spoke about, um, uh, in reference to um, OLA, he said, uh, you know, you can't, you can't, um, you, the only way to deal with a fish is by drying the pond. And by that, he was referring to 
how total displacement and eviction of the Oromo is the only way which tallies with the objective of the Amara vigilantes and the Han, and which is what they've done. And the example is they cleared all civilians from Kiribu district. Imagine clearing all civilians from a district, clearing all 12 uh, Kabeles in Gidda that border with the Kiramu. And it's still nearly 50,000 people are residing as internally displaced people in Gidda Yana district. And, and on top of all that, these are unreported, underreported international media. So it is really a, a sad case of perpetual conflict against the Oromo going on in that region. And the, the, they have, their names have, as I said, uh, metamorphosed over time, but they, they, with a singularity of objective, the objective remained the same. Okay. Um, that's what I would say for now, thank you. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, next, we will move to take a question in the chat. Uh, it was directed to Marga. I'll just sum it up. Um, I think you can you read it yourself. But the question in the chat asked, generally, when you're speaking of militias who are conducting ID checks, who are those militias? And how does this relate to other types of police checks? So go ahead, Marga. Yeah, uh, thank you, Robera, for the question. Uh, I am referring to the the recently established Gachana uh, Surna, or uh, maybe we can say the guardians of the system. Uh, when I say that other uh, other security forces are, I'm not saying that other security forces are not violating human rights. They do, but uh, I want to emphasize on Gachana Surna because. Uh, there are many in number, and uh, many of them has no clue about human rights issues. They they don't do not take any uh, training, so uh, they can detain you or arrest you on the way uh, simply by looking at your appearance or uh, the, the if you maybe uh, the you they they, they can say uh, your hair is a bit longer, so uh, you look like Shane, uh, so you you, you are uh, you should be arrested. This is what they say. And on the way, if they find you, uh, they search they, uh, your phone and uh, your person and everything. So that is what I am referring. I'm, I'm referring to specifically to the, the Gachana Sherna or the recently uh, established uh, uh, security uh, forces. Uh, and uh, to uh, the other question uh, is about the legal action. Yeah. But, I don't know. We have all the laws. Uh, I don't see any uh, problems in the law. The Ethiopia is party to many of the international treaties. Uh, the problem is not with the law. Uh, it is uh, with the institution, with the structure of the state itself, uh, as uh, Abani uh, said. So uh, I think struggling and organizing uh, yourself in a group or uh, in form of civil society organization or in a political party and it may maybe changing the system uh, as i suggested in form of referendum or uh, via uh, transitional political transition uh, can be the solution that's what I, I can say for thank you okay thank you very much uh, we had two comments in person did you still have a comment or uh, uh, comment, okay uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, I have uh, just uh, two comments. One comment is on who Walaga belongs to uh, Amara, uh, and uh, the statement made by Major uh, Dawid. Uh, you know, uh, the Oromo know that Walaga has never been. Uh, part of uh, Amara land or it was not. The Amaras were not settled there before uh, Menelik uh, came and uh, occupied the, can the Oromo uh, country. Uh, what what uh, is historically, uh, the Amara, they, after um, they have overthrown the Zagwe dynasty, uh, extended south, but were driv driven back uh, in the 16th century. Uh, across the Nile. 
they were not, uh, they, they did not occupy that part of uh, Ethiopia, Wallaga, for example. They have come into, you know, along the um, uh, Rift Valley and extended south, and they were, were uh, driven back. In 1669, I guess, they came back through Wallaga, across the uh, uh, Nile, and were driven back from Gudru. That is historically recorded. They have never been in that area. So, uh, what uh, Daoud is talking about is, of course, uh, after many people have come and settled there, uh, not many, but Namtanya uh, have settled there in Gudru. Um, then workers were coming to that area, farmers uh, cross over and work for the Oromo. That was true, that there were settlers, a few settlers. And then when the drought came, when the drought came, people were settled in Wallaga and uh, among others in Guduru. And they were settled uh, um, six Saga, that was uh, mingling uh, the Oromo and the uh, settlers. A Safara group uh, settlement. And that what happened? You know, that happened in, after uh, the 1974 um, uh, famine, but uh, in the 1980s, that happened. And uh, Dawit was the head of RRC, Relief and Rehabilitation Commission. He's one of those who put in the beginning settlers in that area. I was working for the RRC, by the way. I had high positions in the RRC. So I know what happened then. And those people were settled then. Today are they are victims, not from the Ormo, but because from outside they are saying, well, the guy is ours. Conflict is happening there. We, uh, I mean, uh, investigating the conflict, we don't know exactly. Who is dying? We don't know exactly. But the Ormos are dying. Amaras are dying, perhaps. But people who came from Wello are dying, and the Ormos are being evicted. That is what happened. The other uh, point I want to make is about this Galagadai. Galagadai is a word, is a boasting word for Amara warriors historically. Those who killed them, Oromo, Oromo, it means Oromo killers. What happened was in uh, when Kadu, the Chilalo, um, Kadu, what is that called? The Swedish uh, project there. Uh, uh, development. Haile Selassie went there to inaugurate. Obotasam Managari was the secretary of the um, uh, territorial uh, administration. I know him. I met him after they went to Kadu and came back and he was telling us. And Tadasetai he was from Wellaga. He was uh, also. Uh, he was uh, our administrator of Kadu. He was in Wallaga, uh, you know, born in Arjo. And he was administrator. And people were coming in front of Haile Selassie and saying, Boston, uh, Galagadai, Galagadai. Haile Selassie was really uh, astonished, not astonished, but he was uh, disappointed. And that is what I heard after that had happened. So Galagadai means historically, those who kill Gala, you can kill Gala. It's just like you have killed an elephant or a lion, and then you go out and bust. That is uh, the story. I want just to make this clear for people because uh, it is not uh, clear. Thank you so much for that rich context. Um, so we'll just I'll take a pause. We have one more in-person question. So if the panelists would like to respond to Obama Kuria's comment, just keep your thoughts for one minute and we'll take one more question here from the audience. My name is Gia Teke. I was the successor of Gunnar Hasselblad as secretary for the Horn of Africa here in the Berlin Mission just around the corner. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be here today. And uh, my question is to the uh, pressure on the Oromo in Oromia by the Amhara and maybe by other people too in other areas. 
what is the policy, the federal structure that was created in 1991, 92, meant also that in the Oromia region, people would speak the Oromo language, everything from school to public uh, presentations to courts, et cetera, to administration would be in the Oromo language. Now, when Amharas are pressing into Oromia, do they, in fact, come with their Amhara language and the Oromo language in that area where they live is no longer the dominant language that would be against the federal structure. Is the old, as the 1991-92 federal structure still valid or is it completely erased through the pressure for a unitarian uh, new system? Officially not. What's the situation? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, which panelists would like to begin? Please feel free. Um, I can begin if I may. Um, so um, <clears throat> very good question. Um, again, thank you. Um, as you rightly noted, um, officially um, the 1991 uh, multi multilingual multi-national based federal arrangement, arrangement is still there, at least on paper. Um, the pro problem remains one of implementing according to the state laws. Um, the successive rulers on, in Oromia region uh, suffer from what I call, or what some scholars call, uh, politics of appeasement um, to trying to uh, play to the tunes of um, the unitarist um, Ethiopianist group. Um, so that they are not offended. Um, when the Amara, even the illegal settlers come to uh, Oromia territories, including, um, for instance, in Western Oromia, um, actually there are, and there are no evidences to, uh, to present otherwise. Um, they come only with their language and culture. And for instance, in Gidayana, um, the district tried their best to accommodate them, even with their language. So as I tried to um, indicate in my presentation, there are five uh, primary schools where it is only Amharic, uh, Amharic language uh, um, for schools. And this is not even uh, um, discussed um, at the national level when they speak about, okay, in Romia, they don't allow for, you know, uh, Amara um, settlers to use their own language, which is not true, to be honest. At the region level, there are more than 300 schools where um, Amharic is the only language of instruction. Um, so just to come back to your point, um, when they come, they come with only their language. And I, this may not be representative of the whole Amara population residing in Oromia, but for the illegal settlers, this uh, has been the case, particularly in Western Oromia. And a part of the fault line um, has been between this um, uh, seemingly a clash uh, between the two, them failing to integrate into the local population um, is an issue. And I think part of my policy recommendation is for at least legal settlers residing in Oromia, residing in Western Oromia in particular, there has to be a motion to teach them Oromo values, Oromo language, Oromo world view. Um, illegally occupying a territory is very alien to Oromo world view. If we teach Oromo values, Oromo world view, I think that could be one way of resolving the conflict itself. That's what I would say for now. Thank you. Um, maybe, Murga, if you want to go, please go ahead, since otherwise. Okay, so what I would quickly add is um, uh, yes, uh, the 1991 constitution in the ethnolingual federal structure is an improvement for sure, an improvement that is realized um, by the struggle of the Oromo people, but also other uh, nations and nationalities of Ethiopia. And if we look at um, 
the majority of the nation's nationalities, they are um, not against that structure. Rather, the opposition against that structure comes from one group who were at the dominant position for quite a long time. Um, and that's what is causing a problem. Now with the new regime coming, not new really, with the prosperity party coming to power, what is happening is the tendency to play um, kind of gamble between the two, while at the same time um, showing that here we have the ethnolingual federal structure in place, but then at the same time um, working to disrupt that system somehow aids and creates this grievance um, by the larger nation and nationalities of Ethiopia, because this is um, a result of their struggle and their demand that came to reality. Now, is this still in place? At least on paper, yes, it is. The constitution is still there. But then um, what I would like to link to this is often we don't speak about the capacity, the capability of people accessing the right that is recognized, accessing the resource that is in place. Rather, we simply take for granted if a certain right, if a certain system is or institution is established, then we think that is the solution. We think that is an end, but that is a minimalist. And for that matter, I would even call it as essentialist approach because that is just a means that is not an end. And that is what is, in my opinion, causing the problem. And so what I would argue, for example, Amartya um, Sen, um, 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 Helen Nussenbaum, they speak about people's and human capability. We need a law and institution so that people can live a life of their choice, can realize their fullest potential by accessing and making use of resource and laws and institutions in place. If people are restricted, denied an access to this, having the law and the system in place will not be um, of any help. And I think what is lacking in Ethiopia uh, for quite a while is that um, the, those rights are recognized. Now people can speak with their language, they can learn by their mother tongue, which is, which is great, but then um, to what extent is are they able to realize that to the fullest extent? That is one question. Um, and I think that's where the problem lies. And the other two element is this thinking of state-centrism, not only a problem in Ethiopia, but thinking the state as a center of the solution, thinking the state as the ultimate provider of a solution, even at the international level. And this has to do with the post-Westphalian um, state structure that we have, um, which is crafted in the Western world, the, the state is at the center and people are dependent on that. And the line between people and state is often blurred and it's often even seen as one and the same, which is not the case because people can be and often are victims of the state which is supposed to be the protector. And I think this, I guess like an intersection and a combination and cumulative effect of all this factor makes it a bit less relevant having the law by itself as far as people are not having a meaningful control over the over the right they have and the resource. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so just to remind our participants from Zoom, unfortunately, we will take questions from the chat. So we were hoping for you to write your questions out so we could take them that way, just as a reminder. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for today. Thank you so much to these wonderful panelists for these really rich and detailed responses. Thank you to everyone in person, and we will have more time tomorrow for more discussion. So if you had a burning question today, please keep it in mind, and we can try to find some time to discuss more tomorrow. Okay, so thank you. Galatoma. Thank you, Galatoma. Thank you. Thank you very much.